here we are. I mean, we're not here. I'm here. You're there, wherever that is. Um, I hope that uh, everybody's feeling okay and uh, has their uh, anxiety under control. I hope everybody's not going stir crazy but and is able to connect with people, but in a way that is socially distant. Now, all of a sudden, the word social is like in every sentence we say. So maybe this is a good thing for sociology. I don't know. But um, I want you to know that I'm around and you can get in touch with me. Um, I haven't heard from many of you, um, but I'm here. And so hit me with an email. Um, I, I, I hope it's nice to see me. I don't know. Maybe it's a terrible thing for you to see me, but I hope it's nice because it's like, oh, remember that thing that I used to do where I was like in that class with that guy? And um, I wish that I could see you. Uh, I feel sad that I can't. Um, some of you, I mean, others of you, I could kind of, you know, just take relief. Um, just kidding. But uh, yeah, I wish I could see you. I wish I could give you all, um, uh, you know, dumb nicknames. You know, where's uh, where's facts when we need them? You know what I'm saying? But okay, um, let's talk about sprawl. So when we left off before the longest, shittiest uh, spring break in recorded human history, uh, we were talking about sprawl, talking about Euclidean zoning. And um, so I want to do a little bit of content on that to remind us where we were and to catch up. And then the next video will be moving on with the sort of post-pandemic uh, content. So Euclidean zoning, We've talked about this at great length. This is no longer novel to you, not like the coronavirus, novelty jokes. Um, but Euclidean zoning is controlling land use development by type, right? So separating out land use development by type. So you've got your agriculture over here. You've got your um, industrial, light industrial, heavy industrial, residential, commercial, all these things are separated out. We call it Euclidean zoning because of the um, Supreme Court case, um, Euclid, Town of Euclid versus Ambler Realty, uh, which I've talked about. You can look that up yourself, familiarize yourself with it. It's an interesting case, uh, 1926. And so, you know, 1926 was kind of early. It was pre-war and it was uh, in a, a moment in which our cities were growing, but we hadn't really had the boom of the suburbs. That was going to come about 20, 30, 40 years later. But the um, but in the whole scheme of history, 20, 30, 40 years is not a lot. And so this Supreme Court case, the um, Ambler Realty versus the Village of Euclid, Ohio, was instrumental in setting the stage for what later became urban renewal and the growth of the suburb. Okay, I'm back. I think that worked. I'm not at all sure that that was seamless, but um, let's find out. So um, you've got to control height. Um, you've got to, con you, you're able to control height rather. You're able to control the amount of space a structure can occupy on a lot, right? So if you own a lot of land, by that I don't mean a lot like much land, but a lot like a lot being a unit of land. <clears throat> if you own a lot, um, there are probably rules that determine how much of that lot can actually have a structure on it. Uh, some percentage of that lot can have a structure on it. Um, and that's to keep you from building um, a house that goes all the way to every single, you know, um, border of your piece of property. Um, you can also control where a um, structure is on a piece of property. So it can't be all the way in the back or all the way in the front. Uh, it's got to be kind of in the middle. And you can control how much um, uh, landscaping there has to be in a property. So for example, just because you know, well, I can only use 20% of this property for structure. Um, and so the rest of it can be just, uh, just going to build a, you know, concrete, um, slab and, 
put up a tennis court or something, right? You can't necessarily do that because uh, Euclidean zoning is going to is going to tell you there's going to be a zoning ordinance. The town or the city um, is going to have a zoning ordinance, and that zoning ordinance is going to determine how much of that piece of property has to be landscaped, how much of it can be asphalt, how much of it can be concrete, how much of it can be structure, and so on and so forth. Um, oh, and there it is. I, I told you. I told you I was going to make it happen. There's Mr. Burns. He's blocking out the sun, laughing maniacally. And that is what would happen if you built a 20-story house right next to a two-story house. You would be blocking out the sun. Oh, I see. It's an animated GIF, so it keeps repeating. Okay, I'm going to move on now. Is that okay? Is that... Yeah? What? Okay. Bam. All right. Hang on, Corona. <coughs> this is a very dirty inside elbow right here. Just be real careful of that. Don't get anywhere near it. Um, <clears throat> so, sprawl. It's a thing. We all live in it. Most of America is it. We are the subdivision big box store land. That's our identity on the in the sort of global stage. We're the guys with the giant Walmarts with the oceans of uh, uh, you know blacktop parking, surface parking. So how did we get there? Because we're sociologists after all, and as good sociologists we know that um, these things don't just happen naturally, that they are socially produced, or that they are historically contingent. And so what is that historical process that led us to this point, this particular universe, this particular choose your own adventure where we uh, are the sprawl people? And so, the, so 1926, Euclidean zoning, uh, that was a big part of it. That was maybe in some ways the first step but um, in but ten years later, in 1936, uh, the Federal Housing Administration was founded, and the Federal Housing Administration, it's obviously it's federal, so it's a government program. This is a, a New Deal. You've heard of the Green New Deal, maybe. Green New Deal is a reference to the original New Deal, which wasn't green, but was a deal, and. Um, uh, one of the things that the New Deal did was establish the Federal Housing Administration in order to basically subsidize home ownership for, for the uh, upper working and middle class. Um, prior to the Federal Housing Administration, you could not own a home if you weren't pretty affluent. So you you could there was no such thing prior to the Federal Housing Administration insuring mortgages and and offering tax deductions for mortgages. When they did those two things, that allowed banks to be much more free flowing. That is a tongue twister. Free flowing with loans for housing, and so. Um, so we could now, all of a sudden, after 1936, buy, in scare quotes, wait, where's my other hand, buy a, um, uh, a house for 10, 20% down, right? So if you wanted a $200,000 house, all you had to have in cash was 20 grand. You put that down, you get a loan, a mortgage for the rest of it, and banks are comfortable giving you a mortgage now where they weren't a few years prior because the Federal Housing Administration has um, insured the mortgages, is offering tax deductions for the mortgages, so banks feel like this is not as risky of a bet any longer, and so they're more willing to lend you money. And so if they're more willing to lend you money, you're going to get money, and if you're going to get money, you're going to buy a house, right? And that was the whole idea. The idea was because uh, we were in a moment of economic, um, uh, I think, sluggishness would be a gen generous way to put it, in 1936. And so the idea was to kind of jumpstart the economy in part um, through uh, incentivizing home ownership. And it worked. But you th the thing was, you couldn't buy a home 
for 20 grand down in the center city where people lived um, because there were too many people. And so land was too scarce. And you know what happens when something is scarce, it becomes more expensive. When something is abundant, it becomes less expensive. And so we were able to start um, building the first ring suburbs, the inner ring suburbs, those those um, sort of mid-century ranch, like the small mid-century ranch style um, uh, subdivisions right on the edges of cities. And because more people had cars and there were bigger and better roads, ever increasingly bigger and better roads, it was easier for people to get in and out of the city and to these inner ring suburbs um, to live. And of course, there weren't as many people out there, so it was less expensive to build. And of course, the story of sprawl, like everything else, is the story of the search for the cheapest inputs that capital can acquire, right? So real estate developers want cheap land to build on. They're not going to build on more expensive land if they can avoid it. So they're going to go to where they can build on cheap land that's outside of the city. So that's the that's where the suburbs come from. This is, of course, the growth doctrine. This is um, Bill McKibben's idea of the growth doctrine um, very clearly at work, right? This, this quest for the cheapest uh, inputs. So this is what happens in 1936. And then 20 years later in 1956, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower um, signs into law the Federal Highway Act. The Federal Highway Act is a piece of, piece of legislation that essentially creates the interstate highway system, right? So all of these highways that we drive on that have the blue Escudo, what is that called? You know, the interstate, the blue signs, your 39, your Route 39, your Route 55, your Route 74, uh, your Route 80, your 88s, all these things. These are your 95. Um, these are all um, the interstate highways, right? Before 1956, none of those existed. Everything was back roads, although they didn't call them back roads because there weren't any front roads, so they were just roads. But now they're back roads because now we have the highways or the interstates. And so, so once we had the interstates, we could uh, get places much more quickly um, and much more efficiently than we ever could before. And so highways, the interstate highway system allowed us to branch out in a lot of different ways, right? Now we didn't have to live in the same city as our parents. We could live two states over and still visit them on the weekends. We didn't have to live in the same city where we worked. We could live an hour away from where we worked and still commute back and forth each day. It wasn't a pleasant commute. It still isn't. But plenty of people live today, to take a local example, in Bloomington Normal and work in Peoria or vice versa, or live in Bloomington Normal and work in Champaign-Urbana or vice versa. Well, 100 years ago, you couldn't do that because it would have taken you three hours to get uh, between those towns, what takes now 45 minutes, right? So the so what does the Federal Highway Act, what does inter interstates have to do with sprawl? Well, it paved the way for sprawl, and that's not a metaphor. It literally put the asphalt on the roads that allowed people to leave the city and move to the suburbs and so it worked in concert. It worked hand in hand with um, the Federal Housing Administration. And speaking of which, you have to be careful with these because um, they're both, they have the same acronym. So if you talk about the FHA, you gotta be really clear which FHA you mean. And urban renewal um, is the other part of this. We, this is something we've talked about, so I'm not going to belabor this. But urban renewal is, was basically an, an effort at the in sort of the midpoint of the 20th century to quote unquote clean up our cities by um, um, building a lot of highways, making cities very automobile friendly, making them not very neighborhood friendly, building lots of um, big uh, capital intensive public infrastructure projects 
tearing down the slums, building um, high-rise public housing, the, the projects, all that stuff is urban renewal. And of course, uh, as automobiles got cheaper, we got better at making them, they got cheaper. Um, more people owned them and they became more prolific and once you know everybody had their own car and once there were interstates everywhere then it became we became remember we were talking the other day about I, I said close your eyes and imagine that you wake up one morning and all of the asphalt in the world has turned to forest right well at one point it was forest and then we very consciously turned it into asphalt and so um so you know, we have set ourselves up, we have created, we have built for ourselves a world in which cars are the most expedient way for us to get from one place to another. This is a map of, uh, it's a zoning map, it's a piece of a zoning map that I just kind of copied and pasted in um, <clears throat> from normal. And I don't think, oh, I can, I do, I can point to things. Hell yeah. This is awesome. All of our classes should be online. Okay, so I'm, I'm this little, or this little yellow crayon here and I'm circling these gray boxes. So you see these gray boxes? These are single family lots. And you can see that each of these single family lots is pretty much the same size on this side of the street. Now over here, this one for some reason is two lots together, but then these, these are slightly bigger, but they're the same size as the ones next to them until you get up to the corner. And then here on the corner, you've got three lots that are much smaller. Okay. Um, this is just north of, of campus where you're looking. This is Normal Avenue. So if we go south on Normal Avenue, another block here, we will bump right into the Bone Student Center parking lot. And this is School Street. So I actually live, where do I live? One, two, three. This is my lot right here. I own that lot. Look at that. That's me. I'm going to color it a different color. Now you know where to go to, uh, you know, look into my windows. Um, but what I wanted to point out here is, so this is these gray shaded ones, uh, all of this right here, I'm going to get messy. That's uh, the normal historic district as well as this stuff over here. All the stuff with the lines through it, the gray shaded is part of the uh, historic area. And these are all single family houses and they're all single family houses of more or less the same size. If you, let's change colors here. Let's go, oh, let's go purple in honor of my son. Um, if you go over here to this section, you'll see also single family lots, but you'll see that they're all much smaller. So these are smaller lots and smaller houses for lower income families. Um, if you look over here, you'll see this is zoned R1A, and that is, uh, I think it's multifamily. And then um, these are single family over here, but smaller. If you look over here, this is, let's see, the Sycamore and, um, anyway, that's an apartment building, I'm sure, right here. And this over here is also an apartment building. Um, so, or no, I don't know what R3A, what that zone means, but this, the teal one here is an apartment building for sure. So the point that I want to make by showing you this isn't that I can draw beautiful lines, but uh, is in fact that um, even in a residential area, so it, is, it, it doesn't, the Euclidean zoning goes beyond just this is where the houses are going to be. This is the residential section, but it actually groups like houses together. So it creates more socioeconomic segregation and by extension, more racial segregation because you've got larger lots over here, medium sized lots over here, smaller lots over here, and then multifamily housing, you know, apartments over there. And all of these things are separated out from each other, which, um, really flies in the face of what uh, Jane Jacobs or a new urbanist type um, <clears throat> um, uh, 
urbanists would, would argue, right? Because they would say something like, look, the more diversity you have in one block, the more vibrant that block is going to be. And so, you know, you want a block that is mixed use, a block where you can live and shop and work all on the same block, but you also want a block that's mixed income. You want a block where there are apartments and houses uh, together, right? So that you're going to have um, people uh, of different socioeconomic levels, different racial backgrounds, different national backgrounds, interacting together, part of the same community. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, one of the negative things about Euclidean zoning is that it sterilized everything, right? I mean, it's certainly nice and neat. I mean, I'm not taking that away from it. It's neat. If you're a neat freak, it, it's appealing, but it is, um, uh, it robs communities of place of their dynamism because it keeps all these different groups apart. All right, next slide. Boom. So zoning is a thing that you can do and if you don't like the zoning, you can uh, apply to the city for what they call a variance. So there are zoning ordinances. They say everything in this community, in this neighborhood, on this street, you know, the tallest you can build is two stories. Well, let's say you own a lot and you've decided that you really want to build a, a skyscraper on that lot. Um, you've got the money to do it, and it represents a boon to uh, the, the city in terms of economic development, and the neighbors aren't too upset about it. So you go to the city and you say, I want a zoning variance. I want an exception to this zoning law so that I can build this thing that is not in keeping with the zoning ordinance, but which will be uh, to the public benefit. And if you've got enough political capital and you've got enough, remember, remember this, you have to do it with the, you have to make the sound, the lip smack sound too. Money, if you got enough money, uh, then you can get a zoning variance. Now in the Pantograph, which is the local Bloomington Normal paper, there was an article not too long ago about a zoning variance uh, right here, which isn't where you are because you're probably at home. And that's probably not in Bloomington Normal, but uh, you used to be in Bloomington Normal, you know, before the apocalypse. So um, maybe you still care. I don't know. But aha, um, uh -huh. okay, are we back? So as I was saying, zoning variances um, in Bloomington Normal in the Pantograph and the local paper just the other day, or actually a couple of weeks ago now, time moves quickly, uh, there was an article about a request for and the approval of a zoning variance. This building in this uh, photograph here, you might recognize it's on Locust between Fell and the Constitution Trail on the south side of the street. And um, so anyway, this area is zoned for a particular kind of, a particular height of building. It's obviously zoned for apartments, for multi, multi-family units, um, but uh, for short ones, squat ones. And so what happened was the owner, excuse me, of that property went to the town of Normal and asked for a variance because they wanted to tear down that building and to build, I think it was a five story building um, in its place. And part of the zoning ordinance specified that there had to be a um, surface parking space for every unit, or maybe it was even more than one per unit. And this guy wanted to build a five-story building, so taller than what the zoning ordinance would allow. And it was going to have fewer parking spaces um, because he was going to build a circle drive. And so there wasn't going to be parking in front. 
And so there was some discussion about that uh, at the town council meeting, and the town council ultimately voted uh, to approve the variance, and so that structure will now go ahead. So that's kind of a boring example, um, but it is an example right here that pertains to student housing, and so I figured I'd just share it with you. So these things that we talk about in the abstract in this class, they happen in real life in places that we know. Um, so the title of the article or the book chapter um, that we read uh, on sprawl was sprawl costs and um, we've talked about this a little bit but let's let's revisit this what exactly do the authors mean by sprawl costs well there are a lot of different costs um, that are accompanied with sprawl that come accompanied with sprawl and um, most of these have to do with costs to the city right I mean the the real estate developers that build these subdivisions that build these big box stores and that sort of thing they make out like bandits but the city uh, even though we often think of growth in housing, growth in retail, and that sort of thing as economic development. And we think of economic development as unilaterally good for the city. It isn't always necessarily so. And so the book wants, wants to point out that actually the city or the town or the municipal government, whatever it is, loses money, generally speaking, in constructing the suburbs. And the reason is because of this uh, relatively low population density in comparison to the city, which we talked about in class before the apocalypse. So we have larger houses in the suburbs than we do in the city. Okay, That means they're farther away from one another. That means people are more spread out in the suburbs than they are in the city. And this is new construction, right? So when in the city, the, that, that, that already exists. And once it already exists, once it's already been built, you're just paying to maintain it. But the sprawl doesn't exist yet in many places, or it's always being built farther and farther out. And so uh, that's new construction. And so those are new roads that the city has to build, uh, unless you know it's a state or a federal road, in which case the city doesn't. But in some, ca in many cases, the city has to pay for those. They've got the city has to um, run sewer lines out there. Uh, the city has to run trash service and recycling service out there. The city has to run um, water uh, service out there. And of course, everything is more spread out in the sprawl in the suburbs, right? So in the city, you you have one dumpster and that serves uh, a thousand apartment units in one building. And so the city only has to go to that dumpster and put the dumpster on its back and it's service the garbage needs of a thousand families, right? In the sprawl, They've got to do that individually for every single house, and every house has, you know, a three-car garage, and it's only got four people in it, right? So the population density is is dramatically different, and so it's much more expensive for the city to service. The city's got to send fire um, firefighters out there in the case of a fire. They go farther, and they do their work on behalf of fewer people, so it's more expensive garbage collection, recycling collection. They have to go farther, drive farther, more wear and tear on the car, more fuel costs, more um, payroll costs to service fewer people. And so this creates what the article referred to as two sets of underused infrastructure. And what they mean by that is that you have, there's a there is a sweet spot, if you will. There's a certain equilibrium between, let's say, a sewer line that gets built and how many people that sewer line can optimally service, right? If you have too many people on that sewer line, then the sewer line will be unnecessarily stressed. But if you have too few people on that sewer line, then it was a more expensive project to build. It wasn't cost effective if you've got too, fe too few people on that sewer line. So what you want to make a project cost effective is the optimal number of people on that sewer line or on that trash route or on that uh, road or on that sidewalk or whatever public service it is that, that serves private citizens, right? 
And so when you build the suburbs, you have too few people for that sewer line, for that sidewalk. It's not optimally utilized, so it is underutilized, right? So that's one set of underused infrastructure. But what happens when you build the suburbs is you siphon off people that were in the city. Once the suburbs is built, ooh, cul-de-sacs. That's not very, I didn't say that in a very French way, but you know what I'm saying, courts. People are like, I want, give me, give me, give me some cul-de-sac. Love me some cul-de-sac, you know? And they leave the city and they move to the suburbs because cul-de-sac, right? And once a bunch of people leave the city, and we saw this, we don't see this so much right now, but we saw this um, in the middle of the 20th century when the suburbs were first being built, the cities were just emptying out. Everybody that could afford to was moving out of the city um, and moving to the suburbs. And so then you had an underused, a, a suboptimally utilized infrastructure in the suburbs and a suboptimally utilized infrastructure in the sprawl, thus two sets of underused infrastructure. Okay, so we have talked at length about sprawl, uh, where it comes from, what it's good for, what its problems are. And I think that we have um, satisfactorily established that in economic terms and in environmental terms, sprawl is a bad idea, right? Now, in individual, I want what I want when I want it terms, sprawl is kind of the shit because you can have a big old house and you can get in your car and zippity doo dah over to Walmart and um, hit up the fast food and uh, all those things. And it's very convenient and it's very easy and it's relatively cost effective, right? You're going to get much more bang for your buck in terms of housing prices, land prices, food prices, whatever in the suburbs than you will in the center city. So individual just life satisfaction terms, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. We all want happy lives. Sprawl is pretty good. But in terms of um, all the things that sociologists care about, in terms of inequality, uh, in terms of structural marginalization of so certain social groups, Sprawl is problematic, right? Euclidean zoning separates us out. It keeps us apart. It, it institutionalizes uh, segregation in a way that um, we never could before. Um, and it's expensive for the city. It's a, it's a losing financial proposition for the city and therefore, by extension, a losing financial proposition for taxpayers. And it's terrible for the environment, right? I mean, we talked about low density, high intensity resource use. Uh, everybody's using more, um, more fossil fuels per capita, more uh, raw materials per capita in the sprawl than they are in the city. So, so the sprawl, you know, it's got some problems. Okay, so how do we fix that? What do, how do we deal with that? What are the alternatives? So let's spend a few slides looking at those. So new urbanism. New urbanism, by the way, not to be confused with urban renewal, uh, which is a very different thing, but new urbanism is this idea that we should recreate the design of the city in the suburbs. So that doesn't get us around some of the problems of the suburbs, but it does get us around many of them. So it's basically applying Jane Jacobs design principles in the suburbs rather than in Greenwich Village. And so you've got images like this. This is Longmont, Colorado, and you can see and I, I learned now um, from playing the first part of this back that actually the timing of my coloring things on the screen, it does not sync up at all with um, my uh, speaking. So it's going to be, the syncing up is going to be weird and it's going to be hard. So forgive me, but let's let's do a little drawing here. Um, so this is a, uh, let's see, it's not big enough. That, that's too yellow. Let's do this again. There we go. 
That is a single family house. This is a trailer. These are apartments. And this is retail, right? So this is a block in the suburbs that is like a city block where you can live, you can work, you can shop, and where there is um, a great amount of socioeconomic diversity in one place. So this is a design approach that mitigates some of the problems of the sprawl, but not all of them. The other things that we can do to mitigate the sprawl is basically to make our cities more dense, right? If we think of the human population as a zero sum game, right? Which it isn't really because people make more people sometimes. Um, coffee is, uh, is really delicious, if you were wondering. Just here to confirm that, tasty. So, um, so it's not a zero sum game, but let's assume that it is. And let's pretend that like there's just a fixed number of people in the world forever. Um, if you incentivize those people to stay in the city, to live in the city, there's going to be fewer people, obviously, to live in the sprawl, right? So the more we can do to keep people in the city, to encourage people to be in the city, the less sprawl we have to build. So you may see, and here we're going to have a sync up problem with my doodling, but you may see uh, in the city as you're driving through blighted neighborhoods, you might see vacant lots like this um, purple square that I just highlighted. That's a vacant lot in the city. And so that's an opportunity. We can look at that vacant lot as an opportunity and we can think of that as an opportunity to build infill, that is to literally fill in the city to make it denser, right? And so you can see in this other image here, this building was obviously built uh, after the remain the, the other buildings around it, right? So there was some vacant lot there. This building was built in that vacant lot. So filling in, and as you fill in the city, you encourage more people to stay in the city. You create more opportunities in the city, and that takes some of the pressure off to build far farther out into the sprawl. You can also take old and abandoned buildings and rehabilitate them, bring them up to code, um, and make them livable again. And that can create nice housing for people, which can um, also take some of the pressure off uh, to build farther out. And th these two images are actually a before and after of the same building that was rehabbed. And you can just build up. Um, some of you may recall that I spent a bit of time in Madison, Wisconsin, the greatest city in the world. Um, and so this image on my left, is that right? This is my left hand. What's up, everybody? Pow. Virtual no contact high five. Um, on the left, this building, this white building, that used to be around it doesn't exist anymore but it was called university square mall and that's right on was right on university avenue in downtown madison right uh, in front of uh the university of wisconsin well when I, I circa 2006 i think they tore down that building university square mall which was probably a good call it wasn't a great mall it did have a, a nice little uh curry spot it's called curry in a hurry um, in case you're wondering, but it's gone. They tore it down. In its place, remember this is a one. This is a one-story mall. In its place, they built this building that you see to the right. So, th so this this large building here, tall building here, is on the same lot that University Square Mall was originally. And this new building is called the Lucky Building, and it has I, I don't know. Let's count them together. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Looks like twelve stories to me. And the twelve stories, you can see the the very the very first story is all retail. The second story is um, parking. There's a parking deck, and then above that, they've got um, offices and apartments. And uh, some of the apartments are much larger than others, so there's some mixed income kind of dynamic there. So, I mean, that, that, this building, the Lucky Building in general, that's an example of, uh, of new urbanism. It's an example of um, 
uh, not just a block in which you can do all of these things, work, sleep, shop, recreate, but a building in which you can do all of these things. And so if we build up in the city, if we build the city taller, then we build the city denser. And if we build the city denser, then we have less incentive to build subdivisions um, and, uh, and strip malls and these sorts of things outside of the city. So building up rather than building out is another way to stem the tide of the sprawl. Smart growth uh, is basically new urbanism. If new urbanism is a design approach, then smart growth is a policy, set of policies that kind of accompany um, new urbanism. And then, um, skipping this, skipping, 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 skipping. Where am I? Oh, here we go. There we go. Um, the other alternative to sprawl is um, what Portland, Oregon has done, which is an urban growth boundary. And that's, it's really interesting. Um, Oregon has basically drawn a line on the map around the city, not Oregon, I'm sorry, Portland in Oregon, but not the state of Oregon, the city of Portland, has drawn a line on the map around the city itself and basically said, outside of that line, there is to be no development. Anything that's out there already, it's grandfathered in. And if we want to move that line outward, we can at any time. But this is the line. And outside that line, you can't build. Um, and what that does is it, it takes away that main incentive to build the suburbs, which, as you may recall from several slides ago, the main reason why the suburbs exist is because land is cheaper out there. And real estate developers are trying to maximize their profits because capitalism. And as they try to maximize their profits, the best way to maximize their profits is to get their inputs at the cheapest possible cost. And so where they can get the cheapest land, that's where they're going to build. They can't get the cheapest land inside the city. They get the cheapest land outside of the city. So it is that quest, that ongoing constant yearning quest of real estate development to get the cheapest land possible to build on that is the sort of um, lifeblood of the sprawl. And so an urban growth boundary takes that incentive away because it says it doesn't matter how cheap that land is, buddy. You ain't building on it because the city said so. So, hmm. Um, that's what happens. So when, if I'm a real estate developer in Portland and I cannot build outside of this urban growth boundary, I got to build. I'm a developer. I build things, right? Um, where am I going to build? I'm going to build inside the city because I don't have any other choice. So it, it drives redevelopment of the urban core, right? It drives, instead of building out, it drives building in. Uh, and that actually makes it really easy, or, or not really easy, but much easier and more cost effective for the city to maintain that old infrastructure, right? Because they aren't spending all this money building all this new stuff out in the sprawl to service relatively few people, right? So the new infrastructure or the old infrastructure is maintained. It's revitalized. It's healthy. It's strong. It serves all the people. The urban core is redeveloped, it's strong, it serves all the people. And because this infrastructure is much less expensive, the taxpayer actually saves, right? So you pay a lot less in taxes um, because you have um, less, fewer, more expensive services to cover uh, than you would if you were in the sprawl. However, our little supply and demand principle that we have talked about at great length in this class, the less of something you have available, the more expensive it becomes. 
So you can imagine what happens. This is, by the way, this is if we were actually in class, this is when I'd say, so what happens? And I'd ask you and then you'd start talking, but you can't talk, which means I get to talk, which is great for me because I love the sound of my sonorous, malefluent voice. Um, but so what happens is it becomes redonkulously expensive to live in Portland. Like redonkulous, um, which is absolutely a word. So um, there isn't anywhere else to live. You can't live in the sprawl because the sprawl doesn't exist. And so you have to live in the city and there's only a certain amount of space in the city. So space is at a premium and wherever something's at a premium, something is more expensive. So living in Portland is very expensive. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it becomes very hard to do racial justice, social justice. It becomes very hard to have um, diversity, socioeconomic diversity in Portland which is why Portland is mm, lily white, ivory white. Um, what's another super white thing? Not vanilla. Envelope white. Mm, snow white. Anyway, it's a very white place. Um, which is not good, right? You want a place that's diverse. You want a place that, um, you know, uh, takes um, diversity seriously and and racial justice and and um, economic justice seriously. And it's hard to do that with an urban growth boundary, but it stops the sprawl dead in its tracks, right? So pros and cons. Everything is complex. Sociology. Um, so this is what it looks like. Oh shoot, I clicked twice and I went too fast and I don't think that this video will allow me to go back. But um, hopefully you can, maybe you can go back and just click pause on that image that flashed um, across your screen before the one that you're currently looking at. And that is an aerial image of the urban growth boundary in Portland and you see the sort of like really condensed uh, dense small suburbs and then you see a, a road and on the other side it's just um, farming and so you can tell very clearly the delineation is very clear where that urban growth boundary is and this is my favorite photograph the one that we're actually looking at because this is right at the edge of the urban growth boundary where you just can't build anymore and so like the houses in the sidewalks and the streets just stop, boom, <laughs> all of a sudden. And then it's just, I don't know. I figure if you, if you should be very lucky to live in that very last house because then you'll be the, um, you know, when the bears come and eat everybody, you'll go first, I guess. I don't know. Um, so these are, you know, a variety of different ways that we can kind of um, mitigate some of the damage of sprawl. You know, in, in the case of smart growth and um, new urbanism, we're not limiting the building of sprawl, we're just changing the way sprawl is built so that it feels more like the city. Um, in the case of infill and, um, and building up, not out, and rehabilitating and these sorts of things, what we're doing is we're making the city denser um, to take the pressure off of the demographic pressure off of that sort of like drive to move out of the city and into the suburbs. And then with the urban growth boundary, what we're doing is just, you know, um, drawing a line in the sand and saying there will be no sprawl beyond that, uh, which has its pros and its cons as we've discussed.